as announced, I uh, would like to discuss a bit, uh, present a bit about the, in my opinion, poor state of uh, security on the CPE, on the ZIP endpoints. And um, yeah, the motivation for my talk was, as Danny also mentioned, one incident, one issue we had also at the company um, yeah, some weeks ago. And uh, this was the main, main motivation just to talk a bit about this uh, topic. Yeah. I will uh, just give an introduction. Uh, I will present a bit about the yeah, motivation of, from the attacker's point of view to attack the boxes, the CPEs outside. I will present a bit uh, past security issues, um, which were yeah in the which were reported in the media, which were which happened, um, and then I will go in detail about the specific Blitzbox security issue uh, that happened about one month ago. And uh, I will conclude with um, yeah, some remarks from the experience we had in the company and also give some guidelines, to try to give some guidelines how you could prepare against uh, similar or uh, similar issues in the future. About me, I'm, uh, as Danny said, I'm since 2007 as, uh, with One and One and also with the Camaglio project. Um, I'm an open source guy, uh, yeah, involved in Linux and of course, I'm just one, one part of this uh, team at One and One, which operate all these services of all this scale. Um, and I work in IT operations, uh, especially for the voice over IP backend and some other backends in the access customer area. About our company, um, yeah, last year we had some, some pretty impressive numbers again. Uh, we're earning a lot of money. We have. Uh, about, uh, yes, the number two in German DSL mar uh, market um, after Deutsche Telekom, of course. It's hard to beat them, but um, in the last years we, we developed a lot of um, improvements, also a lot of increase in the customer side. If you're interested in the development, you can have a look to the presentation, my presentation of last year. I will present a lot of uh, history and numbers um, with regards to the back end, with regards to the development, which ended up. Uh, yeah, that we, uh, which helped us to be the number two in Germany in DSL and also voice over IP. Um, yeah. Five other colleagues are here also um, from the company, one of my uh, team and also some developers sitting over there and here in front. Um, yeah. The voice over IP backend, um, we have about 8 million subscribers. 8.4 million subscribers, just to give you an idea about the scale what we operate. We have about 100,000 concurrent uh, sessions in peak. So it's one of the biggest deployment uh, which I know out, uh, out there. Also, of course, one of the biggest deployment um, which is publicly announced, which people talk about openly on conferences or stuff like this. Um, we have several interconnections to, to major German carriers. We have, of course, a geographic redundant backend. Um, our customer base is focused towards yeah, small uh, and small and medium offices, and of course, the usual home us users. And uh, yeah, of course, we just provide the usual services, ADs, LVDs, UTS, and LTE since some time. Of course, LTE is just some small, small market here in Germany. Um, yeah, we use Camellio, Asterix, MySQL, just the usual stuff that you know. So why are CPEs, why are the boxes interesting for, for attackers? Why we get these issues, why we will get more issues in the future? One issue is um, that we put, that we, we as carriers and also as manufacturers, we put too many features in one single box. We have several IP, we have, for example, from network point of view, we have IP routing, we have firewall code, we have application level gateway, proprietary quality of service demons. Um, we have all kinds of servers on the box. We have media servers for all kinds of protocols from Windows, Apple, etc. And um, of course, we also implement all kinds of user agents and servers on these small boxes. Um, as you all know, the environment which we which, uh, in which the carriers which we operate is pretty competitive. So the margins are getting smaller and smaller every year. Um, the main competition we have is over price, and this is almost done more or less. 
and then over features. So there's of course a market pressure to put in more features and features and features in these boxes. Um, security doesn't sell, as you know, unfortunately. So there's no big pressure also from the business side um, to prioritize security in the products or to roll out updates. Uh, and either it is from the users. The users just want that they are set up, that their boxes work, and they don't want to break them by some update, etc. And uh, last but not least, um, they are really good target, of course. They are really well connected. And nowadays, you can buy 100 or 200 megabits if you have cable or uh, fiber DSL. Um, they are always on. The users don't monitor them. And they have access to the user data, also to the network data. They have they have two legs in the private network of the customer and in the public network. And um, usually the software and the hardware is outdated. And the last thing, um, they are deployed in a huge number in the field. What issues have we had seen in the past? Just to give you an idea. We had one thing from ASUS, it was called ASUS Gate, some spoiler on Watergate scandal or something like that. Um, it was reported in 2013. Um, the rollout was not done in time because the risk was not evaluated properly. I can imagine. And then it was meant uh, was reported publicly in the press, in the IT press, in February 2014. What did they want? What was the issues? Uh, what were the issues? You could log into the FTP server without the password. You could remote change configuration files. And this would basically mean you could completely remotely own the box and access to all internal traffic, access to all external traffic from the provider which goes out. You could steal backups and invest, uh, investigate the customer network, etc. This was like basically a complete ownage, complete failure from others. Um, some, some newspaper, some IT media did some uh, investigation in this regards, and you can still find. I think one third or one, one half of the boxes in question are still vulnerable to this attack. D-Link also had several issues uh, in the past. Um, you could, uh, one bug was that you could uh, just send them a special POST request and then you can basically execute remote, remotely execute commands on these boxes. In the end you also could access everything, complete ownage of this box as well. And the second thing with this feeling was that they had some issues with the user agent. You just send some special user agent to them, and again, they would grant you complete access to everything, just hand you the key. Um, and this is really, really, really bad. So it's, I can't imagine how these bugs really went un unnoticed that that, that long time. Um, O2 had some small issues in the past. So in the end, everybody is affected from that. Please? Why do you call this pack? Do you think it was a deliberate factor? That's a good question. I don't don't have any any information on this. Obviously, it could be also a backdoor. I mean, of course, if you go start with this, all these conspiracy theories, you could imagine that some agencies or whatever just ordered this. I mean, this user agent bug or issue. This is really close to a backdoor. You're right. I mean, you can also call this. User agent thinking was used to update the DNS. Like Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, so that was the root cause why. Okay. Thank you. What was there? Thank you. Um, yeah. And of course, all these issues um, they affect uh, the, the security of our customers. This is the first issue, and then of course they, they affect the security of our network and basically the whole internet because if there are several millions, tens of millions of boxes out there which can be easily uh, converted, for example, in a distributed uh, botnet then our complete infrastructure is really, really dangerous. So we, just to keep the internet uh, working, to keep the internet secure, we really should do something about it. Um, this is our obligation also as a carrier, as a provider, to work on this issue, in my opinion. Okay, so far to the past issues, um, which I selected. And as you can, as you had seen, they are mostly in the input validation domain. So it's basically a standard threat, if you have a web application or any application, if you don't validate your input correctly or do bad things with your input, then you get these issues. Now to the bug which uh, kept us 
I kept us busy for the several several weeks this year. Um, our network runs almost exclusively on German manufactured Fritz boxes. As you can see on the name, they are um, they are from AVM here in Berlin, and they had several bugs. So you could access the configuration without password. Um, in the morning, they wrote this talk about fraud issues. And if you can get access to the passwords, you have access to the vault credentials or to any credentials which are in this configuration. And you can use this, for example, for fraud. Um, you had another vector uh, that you could do remote code executions from website or HTML emails. So basically, if I get a list of all customers, all our customers, I can send them an email and then um, Outlook or whatever client program they use conveniently will send me their credentials, their passwords. Really, really bad. Um, another thing which makes it worse for us, might be better for us, was that almost all AVM products were affected. Um, yeah. Attacks already mentioned. Yeah, the attacks already mentioned. Basically, you could access the, you know, the internal communication and you could use the user credentials to do bad things. What kind of attacks were seen in the field? Um, we have seen a lot of fraud um, in the media. They had they reported several hundred thousand euros of damage at one provider, seeing one of the cable uh, uh, the cable providers. Um, the Fritzbox also provide a local VoIP daemon, which you can set up, for example, to out to um, call with your yeah, mobile phone, etc. And um, the attackers also use this accounts to do their fraud, just to, to decouple the fraud attacks from the actual network. As a company, of course, we had also several uh, fraud cases. Cases, The damage was also quite uh, substantially, not that much, that high as mentioned here, but it was uh, pretty bad. Um, as usually, these security issues develop over time. Um, it's, it, at first, you don't know that much about the issue. Maybe the vendor don't tell you the whole story. Maybe all, maybe, maybe not all vectors are known in the future. So, in my opinion, this security issue was like a typical development of these kind of things. So first, we only know that CPEs with a certain kind of remote management function was affected. Later, it was reported that almost all CPEs, regardless of this remote management or not, were affected. And later again, reports came that almost all products, including power line adapters and VLAN, uh, VLAN repeater, were affected. So basically, the complete line, product line of AVM, were affected. This looks to me that it was a pretty, pretty old bug hidden in the code base uh, from them somehow. Um, for the public knowledge of this issue, this mirrors somehow the development. So you, of course, you first you have some obscure news sources which develop this, which report um, this story, then get picked up from major major news outlets. And um, in February, in the third week, it was in prime time television, and some so-called self-called security expert went to Stern TV in Germany. Some 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 format, and they showed and told all the world how bad the situation is, how uh, how badly AVM screwed up. And then in March there was a public exploit, really widespread in the news, and then of course the things starting really really getting really bad, because then um, all this all the script keys will all the tools that script keys use will pick up this exploit, and you have really serious issues. Um, Due these factors in the in the this increase in the attack vector, also the increasing publicity of the issue, you see of course, and also an increasing effort in the in the, in the company, in the organization, with regards to this incident response, which is necessary. Um, so this mirrors the effort you need to put in this bug, uh, mirrors somehow the development of these of these things. Um, the reasons are of course to the increases in the attack vector. To the uh, increasing risk to the publicity of the bug, if more people know about the bug, more people are likely to exploit it. And of course, at least if it's in the major television, customers will get really, really nervous and the customer communication will be a bit serious. What have we done um, to mitigate the issue? Um, as, you, as usually, if you have a large organization, you, you should 
have some kind of incident management process in place. So we use this process to just uh, to collect all the information we had, just to coordinate all these tasks that needs to be done. Um, one good thing that AVM did, they, they, um, just to mention, they really did a really great job in publishing all the FIBRE updates in a really, really short time. I think they worked over weekends and uh, shifts just to make sure that the updates get, get, uh, get out fast. Um, this separates AVM, in my opinion, really, really positively from other vendors, like we mentioned before, that somehow don't prioritize this this appropriately. What we have done after the updates were published, of course, we did some rollouts um, on the back end. Um, we did some serious automatization, uh, also with the help from the development guys. Um, of course, if you are not sure if um, customer credentials are uh, have been stolen, you need to change all customer credentials. This also needs to be done. And of course, um, as mentioned in the morning talk, you really need to have an eye on the fraud, on the fraud volume and also the attack vectors that you have. Um, yeah, just some examples what you can do. You can block proactively expensive destination because normally customers don't call to Nigeria or China or whatever. Um, you should work with law enforcement and things like this. How you could prepare your organization, how you could you prepare yourself against these issues. First of all, you should have some processes in place that you can do some incident management and security management. Um, and this should involve not, not only the technical part, the technical parts of the organization, but also the product side and also of course management, because you need to have buy-in from all stakeholders that uh, you can do something about the issues. Um, one great thing that, that, that Arndt and uh, the colleagues from development do, they maintain a really, really close relationship with our CPE vendor with ADM. So every other week we speak with them, discuss issues, and um, this really, really helps if you have a close relationship also on a personal level. If these serious issues happen, then you don't waste time pointing fingers on each side, and then you can uh, but you can start and working on the issue and trying to solve the issue as fast as possible. You should ask your vendor for security evaluations, including source code review. AVM stated publicly in the press that they had four independent security companies did reviews of the software. Um, in my opinion, if they had done a proper source code review, they would, should found this issue because it was really in all the product line, and it was not really hard to exploit in the end. Um, as I mentioned earlier, most of the security bugs are in the input validation domain, so if you just check the 20 or 30 code paths in your, in your uh, CPD, that somehow interact with uh, HTML server, with some password protection, maybe with some other interfaces, you should be pretty okay uh, and have at least some, some security against this issue. If you uh, run a carrier network, you should really enforce the usage of remote, uh, remote CPE management protocols on your customers. Tier 69 is one common protocol. Um, otherwise, you will have a really, really hard time uh, rolling out the firmware and doing also password changes for your customers. Um, you should, just, this is just uh, security one on one, more or less. Uh, Basic, basic, uh, basic practice. You should, of course, ship your boxes with the default secure uh, T uh, and with default conf secure configuration. This improved quite a lot in the last year, but there are still boxes, partly by design, partly by by mistakes, that ship, for example, with insecure and predictable uh, VLAN passwords. You should disable servers that are not needed, not needed, etc. You need to have some resources um, that you can also uh, test the firmware and roll out the firmware. It's not good if you outsource everything in this regard, because if some bad things happen with a major manufacturer, 
Um, we will probably have a hard time to find external consultants in this area because everybody is looking for them. Um, also keep in mind that if you roll out millions of firmware updates, that causes some little cost that boxes break. We have seen um, significant numbers of boxes that were a defect of these uh, firmware updates. Partly this is from um, probably from uh, production firmware, whatever, just 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 wearing issues, and partly this is also done from users because the users what they usually do if the box stops working because of a remote firmware update was triggered, pull the plug <laughs> and reboot the box. Yeah. Um, no. You need to think about the whole process. So just imagine you have too many boxes out there, you have updated 99% <coughs> of them, but for some reasons, you, of course, you still have 20,000 boxes in your stock, in your, in your, in your at, at, at customer support or whatever. Yeah. And you don't want the customers get a new box and plug in, and then they are still insecure. Um, all these things cost a lot of money, so you need to uh, prepare your management that it will cost a lot of money, it will block many, many other product, projects. Um, fortunately, in the other case, our management did see the uh, uh, priority, the importance of this thing, uh, that we are really able to execute it fastly. Um, and of course, you need to communicate it correctly. Um, you should have a close relationship with customer communication. Um, also work closely with the CPE vendor, as I mentioned before. Um, as I mentioned before, the customers will get nervous about this issue and will flood your Facebook and will flood your hotline and um, all of this stuff will happen. So it's, it's, it uh, will basically affect your, your cold customer communication over, week, over weeks if you have an issue like this. You need, as I mentioned before, you need to have real-time fraud monitoring and um, mitigation or alarming tools. Over a weekend or even over the night, a lot of damage can be done. It could be really, really expensive. And in case of something uh, like this happen, you want to improve your existing tools and not start to develop, developing or evaluating uh, new tools to attack and to mitigate this attack during an actual attack. Um, one thing which we also uh, noticed that it's it's not good to reuse your credentials in several places which are not related. For example, if you have a password for DSL login or for VoIP, VoIP login, for the VoIP login uh, at your VoIP backend, you should not reuse this password for other stuff which are visible to the customers. Because then you have a really hard time changing these passwords. You need to send up letters and emails and all kinds of stuff. Um, and this is basically really a, lot, yeah, it's a lot of effort. It's really expensive. Okay. Um, of course, an um, incident like this, it's a critical situation, it's a risk for a company, but you don't want to stop every other project, and of course you can shut down your normal operating of the company, so um, keep in mind that you don't overload your infrastructure um, with these uh, yeah, incident measures, and of course also, don't, also keep in mind that you don't overload your, your resources, your people, that actually doing the, the rollout. And as a last point for the preparation, just this is, uh, this is just the usual thing which you probably already have in place. If you have a, a large backend, you should have uh, overload protection, for protection uh, excuse me, on the edge servers, like your incoming load balancer, session border controller, whatever you call them, just to protect against the the, uh, the denial of service attacks and against uh, really stupid uh, attackers. And you want to have some brute force detection and protection on, the, on your application servers. As mentioned before, it's not meaningful if customers need to authenticate that you check for every request again and again and again uh, on your database if the password is valid. Um, Daniel published some, some guidelines um, some years ago about that. If, you, uh, if your customers, for example, um, provide a one password for three or five times, as an example, then just block them for a certain amount of time. You will save uh, a lot of load, and you will also block uh, many, many attackers this way. Just to give you a short summary, um, 
In my opinion, as usual in this security issues, attackers will only get better uh, over time and the defenders will <coughs> probably not improve that fast or not improve at all in some cases, unfortunately. So I, I, I expect, uh, so you could expect more CPE security issues either directly on your infrastructure or with some denial of service scenario or fraud scenarios um, in the future. Most big, securities, most big security issues start really, really small. So it helps a lot if you have uh, detection logic in place that you can catch the issue um, until it's small, um, if it gets really, really, uh, before it gets really, really big. Um, you should look to pass attacks um, and try to learn from them, try to think them through your organization, how you would tackle an issue like this. This was also a reason I presented this point to you, that you are able to, to look through these issues and think how could I do with a threat like this. You should choose a serious um, CPE vendor um, which has a good track record with regards to security handling, security processes and update policy, establish a good relationship and then stay with it. And with many, with many cases in incident handling, the risk regarding uh, the financial risk, also the publicity risks, are usually much, much higher from a bad handling of an incident than the actual risk that caused the incident in the first place. Um, so don't panic. Um, don't make sense to switch off your complete backend if you just have a risk that some attacks happen. Stay calm, think about the, the opportunity, the, the um, options you have at, have, at, have at your hand, and then make a plan and execute it, and then usually it will be fine. At what attackers do, as I mentioned earlier in the morning in the fraud talk, they usually go after the weakest target. So if you have a decent uh, protection mechanism and have some good process procedures for these updates of uh, firmware, then you have a pretty good position. You are in a pretty good position that the attackers will not choose you as a target, but will go maybe to the other uh, other provider which don't have um, this process procedures in place. Um, and it's publicly public known, and uh, some newspapers did some investigation. We did pretty well with regards to the updates. Of course, also ABM helped us, but there are um, carriers in Germany which are which still have not yet 50% of the boxes updated in place. And we're also talking about several million boxes set up, uh, boxes set up here. So it's a pretty serious risk for them, and I think they will pay. They already pay a high price, but they will also pay continue to pay, um, don't, uh, don't be in this position, um, try to be prepared. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Payne. How you, can you distinguish between all those valid user registering and you look at the user agent? Because you have a lot of registration, I guess, at the same time. You have a good eye? Good heart. <laughs> okay. Um, what is the question then? I'm sorry. Um, what is the police doing in this case, or are you uh, pressing charges? Um, I think the police is investigating. This is the first thing, of course. And then um, that depends on the actual. Um, on the actual attack which is executed. There are some, some stupid attackers which use, for example, German, German servers or German middlemen which will execute the attacks and there are some clever ones. For the clever ones, it's actually pretty hard, at least with German the law enforcement agencies, the police, to, to get after them. But for the stupid ones, I think you can, can catch them. So we had some success in the past years. There are I'm not sure if you know about this money transport Western Union thing. People receive money and then transfer it to some foreign accounts and uh, just cut, cut, cut back their fee. And then in the end, they just get caught. And something this is similar uh, happens also in the voice of a people. They are basically um, they are classified ads and you, they, they just collect people which are somehow rent the Fritz box, their CPEs, to attackers. 
which of course is really, really stupid, <laughs> but these people are not self technically advanced, so they don't understand the risk and the threats. They, they put themselves in, and in several cases, this is stupid um, attackers, this stupid model, we were able to, to actually caught some people, but of course, usually you get the, the small fishes, not the big, the big guys. Um, so, to the extent that you're able to share anything about this, um, aside from the customer relations fallout and the management costs, did Ainz uh, and actually incur any substantial liquidity damages from this particular incident that you've been talking about? Any law enforcement interactions, large fraud losses, things like this? We, I think we, we did pretty fine, also because we did a really good, uh, good work uh, on this issue and we it out really, really fast. I'm not aware of any shareholder visible issues to say that they like this. Um, I think some other companies had, some, had much more issues also with regards to fraud damages. But I think still the, the damage we had, or like the additional cost, it was still... Uh, I can sorry, I can can give you numbers here. Uh, maybe maybe later. <laughs> it was it was a fair amount of money, uh, which means, uh, makes um, the board not happy. I can say it like this, but it don't make the company bankrupt, of course. <laughs> um, you just said in your meeting that or in your presentation that you had a native provisioning for the terminals so that you could operate. It's from Arthur from Pelia, by the way. Uh, what I'm curious about, why didn't the attackers just disable your provisioning? And have you done any countermeasures so if they would have disabled it, that you could control the terminals again? Or CPUs? Disabling from auto provisioning on the CPU? Yes. You, 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 well, you are referring to the to the threat that the attacker is controlling the CPE or controlling the actual uh, auto provisioning, self provisioning logic? Uh, I'm thinking that they control the CPE. If they control the CPE, they can disable the auto provisioning and basically then you are without control of the CPE. Uh, this is a worst case scenario which you don't want to happen, of course. Yeah. Um, so we, we do some, some monitoring of the CPEs we see. So if, like from one day to the other, some substantial numbers of CPE will disappear, we will notice. But of course, if the CPE disappear, you have no big, um, no big means, no big opportunity, no, no big options. Um, otherwise, they um, shipping new hardware, which of course is really expensive. How did you first hear about this problem? Uh, was it your own anti-fraud detection mechanisms? Uh, did you read it in the general press? Were you notified by AVM? How did you first discover this on the other day? I think maybe a combination of this, this thing. So the, um, it was, there were some, some rumors in smaller, not that serious medias, <laughs> media, IT media. There were some reports and of course from the manufacturer. I think more or less it's a process which then from one day to the other new, new, new facts develop. Um, it's a complicated threat or complicated situation like this. It's not that you can say, okay, um, Monday morning at 10, I get the, the, uh, the information and then I know everything. This, I try to, try to present in, in the presentation. It's, it develops over time that you get a comp more complete picture. Um, also, with regards to the issue, the huge issue, also with regards to the impact on your company, on your organization, on your customers. Um, for me personally, I think I, I, I was more or less, I, I, I started to get involved when, the, when it was already internally known in the company um, and we were noticed I think, from the manufacturer somehow in this time now. Was it midnight? No, no, it was not midnight. It was normal, normal day. <laughs> Just as a follow up to that, how quickly do you feel that AVM responded when they realized almost their entire product line was affected? I think they, they responded pretty pretty well um, and also pretty fast. Um, as I mentioned before, some other vendors mm, need, needed to, several months to, to roll out present an update. Huh? Maybe you can share they, something. Um, I covered the, the league and uh, on Friday and then the afternoon they had the 
as the 10 uh, number updates. Yeah. So that was really pretty impressive from their response. Well, we did really, really great. And, so, yeah. and um, yeah, of course, they, they, they made it a priority for the company because it, they, they more in the upper end on the, from, the, from the price point of some products out there in the market. So they have some, some reputation to lose, of course. But um, they did the right thing. And, yeah. Some more questions? Yeah. So how, how can you make this thing uh, more or less secure? In the end, if there are some some bugs, uh, you can take over that box. Yeah. Uh, an attacker could also um, accept, disable the auto provisioning or, or um, yeah, uh, respond back to the auto provisioning. It's all fine, and you will auto install the new firmware, and now it's version of whatever, and now it's fine, but it's, nothing had, has been done. Yeah, because it's just messages that get exchanged and I'm not sure if there's, there's some proper authentication, but this would also not help because you are in control of the complete box. Yeah. I, so. I mean, you're right that it's, that it's uh, hard to say 100%, uh, that it's hard to be 100% sure that, that, uh, that all the black boxes out there are secure or you don't have, have any, any more issues I mean, tomorrow there could be a similar Similar incident uh, happened to, to the boxes. I don't hope so, but um, I don't think so. I don't hope so. Um, in the end, um, which was more or less like the preparation slide, the whole point was, um, and the, the standard process with regards to these issues is like detect, um, mitigate, um, response, recover. This is the basic security process which you follow, and this is just more or less the guidelines which all these all these measurements, all these um, options uh, for um, if you can't be sh I mean, you can't be sure that the firmware is 100% secure um, therefore you must be able to detect it fast if something happened you need to be able to recover fast if something happened and then of course um, in case of um, fraud uh, attacks you need to be able to get back some of, least some of the money you have lost in these in this issues, and then last but not least, you need to go after the attackers with law enforcement and other, other parties um, to, uh, um, to, um, yeah, to, to not motivate uh, similar attackers to go after you at the end. It's more like limiting because yeah. you cannot really prevent when 